But joining us now to discuss those factors is Kevin Kajiwara, co-president of Teneo Political Risk Advisory, where he advises Fortune 100 CEOs and institutional investors on the strategy implications of major geopolitical events. And obviously, this is a major one. We've had major geopolitical events before, and I don't think we've quite seen the type of exodus out of Russia with regards to some of the past uh, geopolitical issues. Well, Rome, I think you're absolutely right, but there's something actually qualitatively different about this. I mean, Putin is completely challenging the norms that we've established over the last 70 years. He's redrawn the map of Europe uh, by force, which is effectively, you know, the central tenet of the post-war uh, of the post-war era. It's what the United Nations represents. It was the, what, what NATO was established to be a bulwark against. Um, and so, quite frankly, the U.S.-led, U.S.-built, U.S.-benefited from system mm -hmm. uh, is what's under under challenge here. Kevin, I'd like to pick up on the conversation that we were with, uh, we, we had with Daniela, just on the degree to which company assets are under threat here. What is the end game? Do the companies generally just write off the assets in the country that they've left, reestablish new op operations going forward, considering just the uncertain duration of this experience and the unprecedented challenge that they're facing today? How does a company actually manage the process? Yeah, Gina, I think that you've kind of hit the nail on the head here, as, as, as did Daniela a moment ago. The, the reality of it is, is we're in a new, a new paradigm, right? And the uncertainty of how long this is going to last, I think we don't even know if we can define what an end game looks like here. I think the metrics for defining victory versus failure is very different for Putin than it is for, say, the United States and the, uh, and the Western alliance. And, you know, as a result, um, there may not be a market to go back to for some time. Somebody alluded to Venezuela and Iran a moment ago, and I think that's the right way to think about it. Also consider that, you know, sanctions have been applied against Iran now for over 40 years. And what have we really achieved when the entire world came together and was able to impose heavy, heavy uh, sanction against Iran collectively? We got them to the negotiating table that yielded the JCPOA nuclear agreement. But the reality of it is there's been no regime change. The people have not you know, brought down uh, the regime. So this can continue for quite some time. And even if you get to some sort of stalemate or even a, 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 a new kind of uh, stability in Ukraine, does not necessarily mean that you're going to see sanctions lift and lifted against the, uh, the Putin regime. What is the China angle in all of this? I think it was fascinating when we were watching, was it the UN vote on sanctions or human rights? On one of those votes, China abstained. And we were all trying to figure out, they're not voting with Russia, but they're not voting with Western allies, right? They're abstaining. Is there a risk as well that companies then start to have to think about their economic ties with China? Or is that just too much of a big fish and we can't go there? Well, I think, Taylor, that what this means is that China is definitely in play. And I think that there's a debate going on uh, in China. You're seeing major policymakers publish papers which, uh, you know, suggest um, a, a view that wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be uh, disapproved in the White House or uh, amongst U.S. foreign policy officials. But... China continues to record, rhetorically support uh, Russia. Chinese media continues to support Russia. But for the most part, what we aren't seeing is China willing to break the sanctions. Um, and they don't want to endure the sanctions. They don't want to endure the secondary sanctions. And they don't want to cut off uh, imports of vital American, uh, American products and technology. Well, and to Taylor's point, I mean, China is way more integrated into the global economy Absolutely. than Russia was. China, of course, has a population that is, I think, 10 times the size of Russia and a, an economy that is uh, uh, infinitely... Uh, I'm sorry, Romain, your battery died. I'll jump in. The guest, since you're sitting next to him, you could hear him. But for our TV audience, I'll repeat, yeah. China is more integrated into this global economy. What do the ramifications mean then for that? Well, we also know that we can impact uh, China's actions. Um, you know, in years past, Huawei and ZTE were both sanctioned and nearly brought down uh, by U.S. sanctions. So, you know, it's something to consider on, on, on both sides. But you're absolutely right. Much more integrated. There's a lot more involved. But remember, you know, China is, a, is an importer of almost every natural resource. And so their economy is impacted greatly by higher oil prices, higher gas prices, higher mineral prices. And this in a year which is of critical importance to Xi Jinping as he tries to secure his historic third term. It's interesting because I think, you know, we've been talking a lot about globalization at large really under fire for not just this year, but certainly for the last decade or so. A lot of trade friction has emerged. Do you see in your conversations with clients, are you talking about a path for lesser 
globalization continuously going forward, or are, are you seeing signs of potential for some stabilization and improvement after this? I think globalization, as we've known it, has seen its high watermark. I mean, for all of the reasons that, uh, that you've been talking about with regards to the supply chain, with regards to uh, the, the, the pandemic hangover and all of that, I mean, the reality of it is, is that with, with rates going higher, um, with inflation picking up, um, and all of, you know, everything that's now needed, supply chain resilience, nearshoring, reshoring, um, perhaps greater decoupling from, say, from China in certain technologies where you're going to have to build absolute redundancy into certain ind industries, that's going to be incredibly capital intensive. We're not even starting to talk about, say, the energy transition as an example. And if, and if capital is going to be, uh, you know, less abundant, um, there, there's going to be a lot of different people chasing uh, that less abundant capital. We had a guest last week who talked about this idea of, of what globalization is today and what it could be down the road. The idea that you had a global economy that was built on the idea of moving things around the globe, goods and services, as fast and efficiently as possible. Now there's a focus, at least in Western nations, about security, and for that matter, in Eastern nations as well, that it's more about protecting your borders, protecting your intellectual property here. How do companies sort of reposition, if that is the case, for a new world order that is less about moving goods around the world and more about protecting what's already within your borders? Well, Ray, I think that the, the uncertainty that you're talking about is, is really the problem here. Mm -hmm. Because, and this is why this issue is, is so important. Because if the United States, if we perceive that the U.S. and the Western model loses and you have mm -hmm. greater decoupling, greater spheres of influence, then that kind of globalization is going to be a, a lot more a lot more challenging. However, if the rules-based international order, international order prevails, mm -hmm. not that we're going back to a status quo, uh, status quo ante by any means, mm -hmm. but having said that, there's a lot more security in supply chains, in, you know, in, 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 in the international markets, in the intellectual property rights, and so on and so forth. Really appreciate it. Kevin Kajiwara, co-president of Teneo Political Risk Advisory. Really appreciate you stopping by.